Welcome to tonight's Missing Middle Information Session, focused on housing and housing development and economics. I'm Katie Crystal. I'm the chair of the Arlington County Board, and I am really pleased to get to be the host of the first of these three sessions tonight. These information sessions represent just one of the many ways for residents to engage with information about the Missing Middle Housing Study. As the board, my colleagues and I deliberate potential zoning changes for more opportunities to learn and to give feedback and to read about how previous input has been incorporated into the study over the past three years, we encourage you to check out the project's webpage where you can find a lot more. So we know localities around the region, around the country, are exploring how to create more flexibility when it comes to housing choice. And increasingly states, and now even the federal government, led by the Biden Council of Economic Advisors, are starting to call for greater housing production to address historic shortages in the housing market. <clears throat> this means that we have a lot of case studies and some good national experts to learn from. Before we launch into the substance, a word just about where we are in the process of the missing middle housing study. Following a recommendation from the 2015 Affordable Housing Master Plan to investigate more housing options within single household neighborhoods, the county board requested that the missing middle housing study be initiated in 2019. The missing middle itself is one of six pillars. Together, they form the Housing Arlington Umbrella. Missing Middle specifically explores if varying housing types could potentially help address Arlington's limited housing supply, choices, and range of prices. The Missing Middle Housing Study started with extensive research on our regional economic conditions, on the history of housing and zoning in Arlington, and our existing land use policies. Then, over the past two years, county staff and partner organizations have sought feedback from neighborhoods, individuals, and groups throughout Arlington, starting from a pre-scoping phase zero all the way to phase two over this past summer. The feedback from the community has shaped the scope, the recommendations, and the course of the missing middle study. Last year, we specifically asked staff to help identify some of the housing forms that, if allowed in Arlington, could potentially offer alternatives to the five and six and more bedroom single family homes that are being built when older homes are torn down and that sell for prices that are out of reach of most Arlingtonians. So the draft framework offered by staff is intended to offer insights about possibilities. We learned that if we were to expand the types of housing options that could possibly be built in Arlington, the cost of these homes would vary based on their style, their size, their location, where in Arlington they are, and market forces. So now our staff is analyzing potential zoning ordinance amendments. They will be doing that through the fall, and we will learn from their work, from our conversations with you all in listening sessions, and from information sessions like the one we're having tonight as we determine policy decisions in the coming months. So tonight's session is focused on housing development and economics, and it gives us a chance to explore some of the challenges and opportunities associated with our current housing policies and housing market and associated with any potential changes to those. So we are so glad to have some special guests with us to answer the most commonly occurring questions. Why is housing getting more expensive? Why are modestly priced homes being torn down when there's a desire for these kinds of homes? What are other localities doing about this? Um, and what have we, can we learn from them when it comes to zoning reform? What will be the impacts of zoning change on what type of housing gets built and how much it costs? So a lot of good questions to dig into before we launch in. I'm so excited to introduce our panelists and to have them also introduce themselves. We're joined today by Callie Seltzer, who's a principal with HRA Advisors, Miranda Carter, a longtime Arlingtonian and a local realtor, and Eric Mary Bojic, who's the executive director of the George Mason University Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship. So I'll ask you all to just take a minute, tell us about yourself and your interest in issues of housing and economics. Callie, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Callie Seltzer. I'm an urban planner. I focus on housing issues, and in particular, housing systems and what isn't working in our cities uh, to get at supply and affordability and create diverse places. Excellent. And I'm a former resident of Arlington for most of my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to hear. Miranda. Uh, Hi, I'm Miranda Carter, um, a longtime Arlingtonian, very proud um, to, to live and work in Arlington, um, and as well as I'm a local realtor. But about a dozen years ago, I really got involved with affordable housing, working um, on the board at um, a home for people that, you know, lived here in Arlington for a while, Arlington Home Ownership Made Easy. Um, and then transitioned over to public policy, um, and that's at the local and the state level, just trying to uh, affect outcomes for more affordable housing solutions in our area. Right. 
Hi, and I'm Eric Mary Bojek. I'm the director for the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship at Church Mason School of Business. Um, so this, the center supports uh, real estate education and topics around real estate development through George Mason. Um, I'm also personally interested and in work with various groups and local governments on affordable housing. Um, I'm a commissioner of the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and I'm also on the board of the Northern Virginia Affordable Housing Alliance. Well, welcome to all three of you, and thanks for taking the time to dig into some of our this community's questions about housing and economics. And speaking of your questions, we are really pleased to have received a number of questions from you all in advance to guide our conversation for our experts. But if you're following along at home, we would still love to hear from you. So send your questions in real time. If you're on the Teams, you can send those in via the chat, or you can call us, 571-348-3053. We would love to take your questions for the panel. So let's start big picture and a little bit with our status quo, which informs this question of why study alternatives. Talk to us about where you see the housing market in Arlington or maybe the region today, and what happens if we don't make any change? What does our future hold? Callie? I think when we look back at the longer history of this place, uh, you guys had great smart growth policies, um, early adopters uh, in the 70s, and had, you know made really great progress um, in terms of growth. And um, in the past few years, I think we've um, gotten to a status quo where uh, housing prices are extremely high. Um, people are being pushed out or not able to uh, gain a foothold in homeownership in Arlington, um, which is a very different scenario than 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so that, to me, is the most uh, salient part of the status quo right now. Yeah. Oh, Miranda, does that track with what you see as a realtor? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's so many times I, uh, I start out working with folks right here in Arlington. That's how we meet up. Um, but the the cost of housing in this area just is just cost prohibitive, and they have to end up moving outside of Arlington just to find something that's more affordable um, for them. And of course, you know, you know, I, I've lived here, and we've all seen and tracked how our our, our housing values have just, you know, almost doubled in the past couple of years, and it doesn't seem to be any end in sight with the housing prices with the limited supply that we do have right now. Well, I'd like to echo, I think, um, the, the community of Arlington have created a very dynamic place with lots of economic opportunity, and uh, I, think, I think these are questions of success, uh, frankly. Um, Arlington is poised to grow by another 60,000 residents, I think, in the next 20 or so years. Um, all those residents have to be housed. Um, thus far, I think Arlington's been building a lot of rental housing and not so much opportunities for ownership. Um, being a fully built out community and an, an older community, I guess the question is, you know, how do we build for those new people coming? And what types of houses are we gonna offer them? Yeah. And I think that's the crux of the conversation I think the community is having right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, when you say we, right, we talk about this collectively, mm -hmm. there are a couple of different forces that determine what gets built, where, how much it costs. Um, there's zoning, right? There's regulation. There's also the market, market forces. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about you know, what we have control over as government? <laughs> We'd love to think we can control what gets built and where, but how um, government policy interacts with market forces. Well, I think from the from the point of view of real estate development, which is you know part of what we teach uh, over at Mason, so the intersection of government policies and the market forces are what provide the business incentives for developers to build what they build. Um, if your public, if your policies, uh, zoning policies, and other policies uh, that you have encourage the building of uh, you know large single family uh, houses that are more profitable for developers. And, and there's a market demand for that, uh, that's what's going to get built. Um, developers uh, take on risk-adjusted returns, as we call them. They, they view the landscape, and you know if something is available by right, which is the lowest risk available, and there's a demand for it, then that's what they're going to respond to. And, and right now, um, I think the, from the reports that I've read from the Missing Middle Study, you know about 100 or so houses are being torn down every year the majority of which are three bedroom, 1,500 square foot older houses, and they're being replaced by new 5,500 square foot houses that are costing you know, upwards of $2 million. So that's what the market is, that's what developers are responding to because of regulation, zoning, 
as well as the market demand. And I guess the debate is whether we can tweak the regulations to provide other incentives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'd love to hear too from Kelly and Miranda. You know, one of the questions we hear a lot is, well, there are plenty of, you know, moderate income folks who'd like to buy a moderately sized house. <laughs> what is going on? Why isn't the market providing for that? And I think Eric just described one of our biggest challenges, which is the, the um, replacement of modestly sized homes with very large ones. Um, the community has talked a lot about, you know, missing middle is maybe one way by getting more flexible in our regulations, providing alternatives. Do you know of any communities that have tried to get more restrictive about what can be built? Um, and what kind of results have you seen there? Uh, I think there's now a long history of communities being pretty restrictive. Um, and the results are, are clear from the data um, and also in communities where we're reversing these policies and, and, and deregulating zoning to allow for more diverse opportunities in housing. Um, restricting it does not solve the affordability problem. It does not solve the supply problem, obviously. Um, and there are a lot of people in Arlington that I believe want to and would live in a smaller house, smaller footprint, a little bit less land, um, in, a comp in a way that is compatible for your neighborhoods and, and the character of this place. So, Yeah. Well, I think um, that's a great question to, to lead into one for Miranda, which is, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about um, uh, what you're hearing from the folks you're working with, the buyers, about what, what they're looking for in terms of housing and uh, who's being served by our market and who isn't. Right, so um, with our current housing um, types that we have here in Arlington, it, it's, it's pretty simple of who goes where. The condos that we have here, those are usually, I always sell them to a single person. That's, that's who's gonna buy a condo. The townhomes and um, duplexes that we have, those are couple or very small uh, children. And then the single family homes are families. Uh, and this is all we have here um, mm -hmm. to choose from, and um, not a lot uh, of it. And um, and just to even piggyback on what you were saying before about if we do nothing or become more restrictive, that's not going to erase the desirability of living in Arlington. It, 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 this is not going to disappear just because you restrict it. That people aren't going to want to live in Arlington and. They will pay, and that's going to drive up the prices even more by restricting it. And I think that's counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do we know then from communities that have tried to get more permissive? One of the things we're all so desperate for in this community is a crystal ball. What happens if we make this policy change? What's going to get built? Where? What will it cost? Um, we don't have that crystal ball, unless you guys are hiding one that I don't know about. <laughs> but we do have a few communities we've seen around the country um, go first. Uh, or at least try these. So, um, Eric, Kelly, what do you guys think? Any lessons that we can learn? Well, you know, missing middle is really a housing type uh, more than anything else. It's a house that has a smaller footprint. It may share uh, some of the walls with other units. And this is not new. Um, missing middle types of houses have been around even before zoning. Um, and when you walk around old cities or, or college towns, you see missing middle houses. They're not called missing middle. They're just uh, quaint. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is really, in some cases, going back to what was permissible before a lot of zoning regulations came out in the 30s, 40s, uh, and 50s. So you have communities like Boston, Chicago, uh, which are well known for plexus, um, and, and Montreal. I think those are the three cities with the most number of plexus. And those plexes serve in those communities as starter homes for, for people who live in those communities even today. Um, now, in terms of new types of uh, modern versions of it, um, it it's, it's always interesting to go look at a development that's designed for multiple types of properties on the same street, which is a lot mm. of what Missing Middle is. Uh, locally, we have an example of that. It's called Kentlands in Gaithersburg. So if you go to Kentlands, it's designed with a single family, you know, side to side with a duplex, a bunch of townhomes. So it's, an, it's a really good example of a designed community with a lot of missing middle mix. And you can see there that you know, the prices range from 400,000 to 1.5 million in the same community of about you know, 1,500 homes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's, uh, that's what's achievable <clears throat> when you have different types of housing. The price ranges are all present. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then there are there are communities, um, you know, that that have tried what we're doing now is to reintroduce missing middle. Um, I think you know the ones that that I've studied, uh, say Minneapolis, which introduced it to great fanfare a couple of years ago, or Portland, Oregon, um, which is well known for being a lot more receptive. I think the the response has been slow. Um, you know, trying to provide incentives to private industry is always a tricky process. Uh, Portland and Minneapolis both have you know 50 to 100 units of missing middle permitted in about a year or two years in some cases. So I think the I think the progress is gradual. It's not going to be sudden. Um, it's going to be iterative. Uh, there'll be you know corrections and change changes of, uh, of of regulation over time to get it right. And so I think I think that's to be expected. And, and I, I think I think the the study that you have. Um, I think is projecting 20 a year, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, based on some of the experiences of other communities that may even be a little aggressive. But you think we'd see fewer? You could, based on, the, based on the experiences of much larger cities like Portland and Minneapolis. But I guess the point is, we, we don't know. Um, thus far, we've seen slower, more incremental implementation. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be like we flip a switch and overnight we have a whole bunch of, of projects. I, I think I think it's much more nuanced than that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so that's really interesting. I will say this is one of the biggest topics of conversation in the community. We have um, an, an economic analysis as Eric was talking about that indicated about 20 a year. Um, but I know there's definitely a sense that you know, perhaps we've got our finger in the dam, and if we take it out, Arlington's neighborhoods could transform overnight. So I would love to hear, um, Miranda or Kelly, from what you see, you know, whether it's from the perspective of buyers or other communities or builders, um, what gives you a sense that, if you share Eric's sense, that this won't transform overnight, what gives you some sense of that? Why, why would you not worry that um, the pace of, of this kind of development would happen really rapidly? So, I mean... Um Kelly can probably speak a little bit more about this, but uh, again, as Eric was uh, uh, saying, uh, builders, this would be something new, something unknown. They're not that, um, they're not usually known as being risk takers. They're just gonna go out here and try something and build a lot of it and not, you know, have some, some data to show that it's gonna actually work. So that's why I, don't think it's going to happen overnight, and I think it's going to be very slow. And I and I would, I would be surprised if we even had twenty, yeah. um, in, in one year of something very new. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would say by and large, in the communities where we've worked, um, in cities of similar type, um, it definitely doesn't happen overnight. You probably aren't even going to see it on your block. Um, and while there is a lot of pent up demand, you know, most of that production happens in year one to one, two, three. Um, beyond that, it's really hard to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, but the every community that we've studied uh, that has implemented these kinds of zoning reforms, um, the rate of change is just not really anything to even write home about. Yeah. You get mm -hmm. some more supply and you unlock home ownership for a band that it hasn't been affordable for. Mm -hmm. um, and that band is, um, you know, not even the same as like deep affordability, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about people making. Point. $100,000 a year for a family of four. Yeah. Um, that's the band that now has a, a foothold in, in home ownership when you do these policies. Um, but to your, to your point, Miranda, developers, um, you know, unlike cars or car production, um, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't flip a switch. Um, mm -hmm. This takes time. Uh, there is a lot of risk involved. Mm -hmm. And it's still going to be very expensive and difficult to build in Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not too concerned from everything I've seen that um, this is going to lead to any kind of radical uh, change at yeah. the neighborhood label level. That's really helpful. And I'm rudely looking at my phone because I'm watching these questions come in. I should credit that one came from, from someone in uh, the old Glebe neighborhood. So okay. thank you. Please keep them coming. Um, great question about that, that pace of change piece here. Um, to go back to that question we were having about, you know, is there a way to, to use that tool of government regulation to restrict our way to affordability? Another question that, that came in is, what happens to the price of housing if you limit the size of the house? So if um, we were to restrict the, uh, the footprint availability, uh, the buildable footprint on a single family lot. So only thing allowable is single family, but we're going to restrict it further. What happens then? 
Well, let me take a crack at that one. I, I think our, our tradition uh, has, has always been in the housing market in this country as, as a free market tradition. Um, so we, we do regulate through zoning and what can be built where. Uh, we do regulate through building code, you know, how safe and, and f uh, you know, for fire and so forth. But I don't think we have a tradition of building, uh, of restricting uh, the types of houses uh, people can build, especially uh, size of houses, I don't think. Mm -hmm. There are some communities that um, have, you know, special restraints like, uh, you know, Tangier Island or mm -hmm. some of these communities that have really, really special restrictions. But I think like a community like Arlington, um, I, I think, uh, you know, giving those kinds of restrictions would, I think, even be more onerous than zoning uh, in many cases, because uh, zoning is prescriptive, but it's not restrictive. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll, it, uh, you, uh, developers can work within the zoning. Um, I, I think any, any restrictions on, for example, the, what you can build or even the rent you can charge mm -hmm. uh, or, or price controls, I think in the long term um, may give you some short-term benefits, but have long-term negative consequences. I think yeah. that's been proved yeah. over and over again and um, you know, I think I think trying to work with the, the the free market in terms of housing, I think is the best way to go. Yeah, I'm seeing some nods at that. Yeah. That maybe you get some <laughs> short term gain, but but long term, it's not necessarily the path to a healthy community. I agree. It is not the path to vital, diverse places. Ar Arlington already is one. It's a mm -hmm. place where people want to live. It's mm -hmm. going to continue to be that. Um, we have to create more housing. The neighborhoods that people most want to live in can't house everyone. That's okay. Um, you know, they can't accommodate everyone that wants to live there. Um, but there can be some new housing added and some new opportunities in those neighborhoods. Um, and I think when you look across the country um, at examples like Somerville, um, you know, neighborhoods where people walk around and there's some duplexes and there's, you know, some people, you, you love those neighborhoods. Um, and Arlington has some of that sprinkled in. But, um, yeah, just echoing, yeah. echoing that it, the change is coming and that it's kicking the can down the road if you don't increase supply. Yeah. You're feeling the pain of many years of that regulation now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're, we're all for housing choice. And I think anything restricting those choices, um, it's not that large houses are going to be stopped being built in Arlington. I think that will continue. Yeah. It's just a matter of will other things be built. And, and certainly restricting it to one size is is. is, is in many ways, restricting uh, yeah. housing choice, not expanding it. So I, the point that you just made, um, large housing will still continue to be built in Arlington. One of the other kind of um, questions that we get or sort of premises is this, this question of, do we think that houses that are, you know, modestly sized houses that are being torn, in, torn down and turned into a very large single family houses, um, you know, some subset of those might become missing middle. Or do we think that if missing middle forms were legalized, that's going to create a lot of new development pressure to homes that otherwise would not have been torn down um, and accelerate the teardown phenomenon? So this is something I hear a lot as a question. Do we have any insights from other communities or just what you know about how the market behaves that, that can, can indicate that? Uh, well, what we've seen in other communities is that, by and large, owner-occupied housing um, doesn't turn over quickly. Mm. You know, you might reach a point in your life when it makes sense to sell your home, um, and apparently it co coincides with when your dog dies. We have seen some data that <laughs> Fascinating. correlates those two. It's very interesting. Um, okay. But uh, it doesn't happen overnight. People, you know, owner-occupied housing is slowest to turn over. Um, so that, that's, that's what we've yeah. seen in, across the country. And yeah, I think the data shows that um, nationally, um, I think there's like five million or six million sales uh, every year mm -hmm. of, of homes that are existing. I think that's about a 5% um, ratio that turns over every year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think I echo that. Uh, the, not only are there the opportunities to redevelop uh, slow, but as we mentioned, the building of Plexus also is slow. So I think this thing will be more of a gradual process mm -hmm. and probably won't be... Um, you know, highly visible or highly impact. Uh, Laborers won't be highly impacted, I think, until um, I think this process matures a lot more. Yeah. So that's a great question, too, that, that, that point about um, neighbors being impacted. So we definitely, a very common question, we have one in particular coming in from Westover about what does the construction of mixed housing types do to the values of existing single-family homes nearby or in the neighborhood? Well, I'll, I'll start off. Um, 
there are studies uh, of the impact, for example, of new multifamily development on, on single family homes. Um, the most recent one I, I read was in Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City. Now, mind you, these are not missing middle types, but rather just uh, multifamily neighbors. Okay. And the, most of the studies that I've read have either a slightly positive to a neutral effect mm -hmm. on home values. Um, that's what the data, the data kind of shows. Uh, of course, the perception is different. Uh, there, there is that perception out there that these are you know, highly negative impacts. But once you study the, um, the actual data, and I suspect it might have to do with the fact that you know, where developers place new multifamily housing are typically in dynamic neighborhoods anyways. Mm. So um, house prices will go up just because of the nature of the area. And um, having somebody make a real estate bet that they're going to invest millions and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in this particular neighborhood only shows the, the desirability of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So home prices don't really go down a lot based on some of the recent studies. The value of the land gets spread across multiple new owners. Yeah. Uh, and so that's part of what gives you a little bit more affordability, brings mm -hmm. the price of the overall unit down when you're building townhomes, which we see as being a very um, common, from a financial perspective, mm -hmm. duplex townhomes, two over twos, you see a lot of those in Virginia, um, four units, eight units, those are all typically more financially viable. If, mm -hmm. if an investor buys a site and tears down the house that's there, um, that is, you know, likely to, uh, if they decide to do anything on, you know, very few investors are actually doing this. Um, but it will be in that two townhome, fourplex, eightplex. Eightplex can be really expensive to build. So mm -hmm. I think you'll see the change in those typologies in a way that's compatible with the neighborhoods um, if the code is written, you know, to be compatible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, were you gonna add? Um, no, I was just gonna echo off um, what you were saying, Callie, too, um, and Eric as well. If you even think about it right now, of what we've seen here, um, within uh, Arlington, I mean, Eric's already spoken to how we've torn down a lot of um, things and built um, more affordable rentals um, in the area, and that has not um, decreased uh, the housing prices and mm -hmm. the values at, at all. Um, and if we're only on home ownership opportunities, that also should not decrease um, the home the home value next door um, because these are, in, you know, invested parties. Um, and again, Arlington is very unique is that we're very, very small. Um, and and um, there's, like I said, there's always going to be demand um, yeah. to be here. So um, I don't think building uh, a fourplex or um, an eightplex is going to drive down my home value if it's right next door to me because right now we can see it that it, it what little has been built um, around here has not decreased our home values. Right. So here's the other side of the spectrum that we definitely hear some concerns about. Will this spike home values, right? People know that their property tax bills are going up because their assessments are going up. Um, you know, they, they don't want this to lead to people feeling displaced because they can't afford their property taxes anymore. Um, so can you guys shed some insight for us in, um, you know, if, if your property is um, uh, currently zoned for single family only, how is that value capital, the development potential capitalized into your home and how does that change if what you or a developer is allowed to do with it changes? Is there a reason to worry that that might spike the value of your home? Um, you know, I, I think in terms of tax efficiency, um, so you can either have a, a small home knocked down and a big home placed on it that's worth, say, $2 million. Or you build a fourplex that's $700,000 each, and that's $2.8 million. Yeah. So from a property tax perspective, density is always more efficient mm -hmm. for maximizing the value of the same amount of land for, and, and collect more taxes. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you know, high rises uh, typically pay for a lot of the taxes of the low rises mm -hmm. in, in Arlington. And Arlington has done a terrific job developing transit-oriented development in a small, in like a, you know, a small part of the county 
which generates probably a, a, a substantial part of, of the property taxes. Yes. I think it's so, almost 50%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. From so, the corridor. Yeah. Between. So think of that as if yes. you allow just a little bit more density in the 75% of the county, then for the same land, the county can collect uh, more taxes because there's just more units on there. And therefore lessens the burden, hopefully, on the more, again, more density always subsidizes the taxes of, of less density. And I think that's true with plexus uh, compared to single family homes, yeah. um, even large single family homes. So it's, it's always more tax efficient to introduce a little bit more density from that perspective. That's a really salient point. More density subsidizes the less density when it comes to the tax base. Yes, and Arlington's very lucky because there are jurisdictions that, um, you know, predominantly they're, you know, used to be known as bedroom communities. Yeah. They have all the services of a full, you know, full size community, but they don't have the tax base. Right. Uh, mm. You know, they're all they're all low density single family, and and the burden falls squarely on on residential properties mm. to bear all the costs of services. And so density, whether it's residential density or commercial density or office density, will always generate more taxes to cover that for, for the rest of the community. Yeah, it's a really important insight. Well, one of the things that had come up too um, was this question of home ownership. And Miranda, I know that's close to your heart, right, with the, the professional work you do. Um, that's a big question we're hearing a lot about from the missing middle. And there's one specifically we've gotten from Boston Virginia Square, which is, are there specific factors that influence or guide whether a particular housing unit ends up as ownership or rental. So is there anything that can be done in terms of regulation or are there things outside of what government does that, that would make a fourplex more likely to be for condominiums providing a home ownership opportunity or for rental units in one building? I don't know if that's a stumper. This is a little <laughs> bit the crystal ball question, right? Mm -hmm. I would just add, what we've seen in the data is that usually the most economically rational decision for a developer who's building more units on what was a single family lot um, is for sale units, condos. Um, sometimes it's apartments, um, mm -hmm. but to you know Eric's earlier point about um, kind of free market and that is what you know is going to drive these decisions, yeah. owner and investor decisions on what happens on that site. Um, can you unpack that for us, Kelly? Why sure. is it more economical for them to sell yeah. instead of trying to rent them out? Yes, a little bit. Um, so, you know, their developers are are willing to take on some amount of risk, um, and it, they have different business models. They come in all kinds of you know sizes uh, and, and types uh, in Arlington, um, but uh, there is a lot of risk associated with development, and there's just a ton of pent up demand for. Um, smaller scale home ownership for people that are starting mm -hmm. out as families, people that are, you know, your teachers, your firemen, to put a face on it, uh, people that maybe um, are really paying more already than 50% of their income to afford to live in Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just a ton of pent up demand, and we know that unlocking some of that home ownership um, will, developers are going to build what they know the market wants. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, you can speak to what people are buying better than I can for sure, but, um, you know, those those small condo units, um, 1,000, 1,500 square mm -hmm. feet, uh, not even that small. I lived in a studio for <laughs> most of my <laughs> adult working life. So um, that, uh, there's, there's a lot of risk that they have to take on when they um, are looking at this. Um, so, yeah, the, the private market will respond um, mm -hmm. if there's an allowance for a larger number of housing types. Yeah. And we've seen it in, in many cities. That's really interesting. And I don't, you could probably add some face to that, right? What is the demand? Because I've heard that, right? With, you know, isn't, isn't the demand for one to two bedroom condominiums being pretty much satisfied in elevator style high rises? So, so mm. talk to us about what you're seeing, Randa. No. Um, no. I, I, like I've, I've said um, repeatedly, people want to, they want to stay in Arlington. They're a renter. They want to buy, and they want to buy in Arlington. They already know this place. They don't want to move. Um, and a lot of times that first step is a condo. Um, and we don't have, contrary to popular belief, I know it's Boston and, yeah. you know, um, you know, Clarence and Virginia, but we don't have that much supply as far as condos, and that is um, the excellent starting point yeah. um, for home ownership, and especially when we're trying to address this missing middle um, of the lower end of the middle income um, person that's, you know, the 100s. Mm -hmm. uh, this is definitely what they can afford, and there would be, um, in my opinion, uh, definitely a pent-up demand yeah. that you could actually 
stay right within Arlington. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I can uh, that resonates with me personally. My the first home that my husband and I bought in Arlington was a two bedroom townhouse in a missing little low density neighborhood. Until interestingly, our dog died, and we moved to a slightly larger <laughs> townhouse. There's a so, Kelly, this is uh, you know maybe this is an important that. strategy yeah. about maintaining the health of Arlington's canines is the uh, is the key to piece yes. of change managing. Um, uh, so rest in peace, Bear. Yes. Um, I, one of the things that's also interesting, you know, you guys have given some great examples of communities where um, you see this kind of development historically, right? The older, and, and I think we can all visualize that, right? Like the, the charming row homes of, of Western European cities, for example. And we do have, you know, some existing middle in Arlington. There's actually a brief plug for people to visit <clears throat> the Missing Middle Study webpage. We have a virtual walking tour where you can see these forms in Arlington. So there's a real question about, you know, how um, how do the prices of these types of units age over time? We've seen from the economic mod modeling from um, the uh, the PES study that these are still pretty expensive, right? When they first hit the market, especially the the duplexes or townhouses. Um, but we also know that new single family housing is really expensive when it first hits the market, closer to three million or more. So talk to us about as, as housing ages, um, what does that do and, and what can people expect? You wanna talk about down filtering and? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, when we look at missing metal in any housing typology, really we have to look at it comprehensively as the entire housing spectrum, the entire housing market. Mm. Um, all the way from the higher end part of the market with larger homes for larger families or people with larger tastes, down through, as uh, was mentioned, families that are growing up, having demand for more bedrooms, down to people with young kids, down to people with no kids, mm -hmm. down to people who ju or just prefer uh, you know, uh, one unit, one bedroom living. Um, and so um, when we build miss new houses, new, new missing middle houses, that, that uh, addresses one part of the entire housing chain. And uh, when people move up to the next level of the housing chain, um, if you don't have that next home available that mm. fits your preferences, in this case, um, let's say, you know, apartments and condos are for one and two bedroom households. You know, large houses typically have, you know, four, five, six, seven bedrooms. As I mentioned, uh, the most typical home being torn down is a three bedroom home. So if there's nothing to move up to, mm -hmm. that creates the scarcity that drives the, the price of whatever mm -hmm. is missing, or not missing, but short or scarce. That's what drives the prices up. And that incentivizes people to start knocking down uh, things to create, to create that demand. Um, I think the, uh, Arlington had an issue a couple of years ago of um, small, affordable apartment buildings being knocked down for townhomes. Town yes. So you actually were seeing the market push for less density. Well, because the, the townhomes are missing in Arlington. Oh. If, if that doesn't exist and the demand is there, uh, some of that will be met by redevelopment of stuff lower down the chain, like, uh. like affordable, yeah. small, affordable rental houses in order to create that. That's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the knockdown of, of smaller houses for, for larger houses. So in a healthy market, you should have all of it available for people to move up to. Yeah. And um, what, anytime we have a, a, a missing port of the market, then that creates the price distortions mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, things age, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think um, today's, you know, today's Three bedroom missing middle is tomorrow's twenty year old starter home right. for somebody else. Right. Right. That's kind of the way a, a healthy housing market right. market works. So when we say missing middle, I think we mean it in a lot of ways. It's yeah. the type of house, the size of house, the position of the house in the housing market, yeah. the income of the people that can afford these. You know, they're, they're, you know if it's missing, then that's that's what I think uh, policy mm -hmm. uh, can address. 
That's so interesting. You know, one of the, the observations that I've heard, and I bet you see this in your home buyers, Miranda, is um, we, we talk a lot about Fairlington in Arlington, which mm-hmm. is kind of our existing middle, right? Mm-hmm. The townhouses. And, and there's this, we're all sort of baffled by the fact that these pretty modest townhomes in Fairlington, which have represented an entry point for a more mm-hmm. middle class buyer for a generation, are now really, really like expensive. ratcheting up in price. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that insight that unless you're allowing more to be built over time, the demand is really going to start to to put that pressure up. It's not just the square footage of the house. It's whether there's scarcity of that mm-hmm. type of house. Yeah, and and any healthy community will have all sorts of people living in it. Um, Arlington's no exception. Um, when the scarcity gets bad enough, then that type of household leaves the community. Yeah. Um, if you don't create housing for families with young kids that need three bedrooms then they go somewhere else and they commute here. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so it'll show, up, it'll show up in the community in some form. Yeah. It'll show up as traffic if they live somewhere else. It'll show up uh, in the lower end. It'll show up as homelessness sometimes when there's no low-income housing, uh, enough low-income housing. Um, so it, it has all these uh, visual cues that you can see mm-hmm. in communities that have uh, something missing in them and, and, and not addressing the needs of the entire community. Yeah. That's a really trenchant point. Um, well, you know, you were talking about the, that sort of phenomenon of drive till you qualify, right? Um, and, and how that can impact our air quality, for example, people idling on 66 or 395 and the environmental impacts. Um, but we are trying to understand, you know, what Arlington's role within the region. And, you know, the Council of uh, the Washington, Metropolitan Washington Council of Government set some targets for, for housing production. But I'd be interested, um, Eric and Callie, because I know this is something you study about Arlington's role in the region, right? I, I hear a lot, and this is fair, Arlington can't you know, solve the region's affordability problem ourselves. Um, but, but help us understand um, you know, what we can do in context of being part of a large and growing and dynamic region of the country. Yeah, absolutely. And Arlington is such a desirable place to live. Uh, So people will continue to want to move here and stay here. And creating opportunities for them to be mobile within that housing spectrum, you know, starting maybe in a studio unit and as they, you know, make a family, et cetera, a little more space over time, uh, typical pattern. Um, Arlington in the larger region um, is a huge driver of our diversity, a amazing um, amount of diversity in just food. We were talking about mm. South Korean food before yeah. this. Um, you know, this, these are things that people will always come here for um, mm. and, and stay, want to stay here for um, in terms of job growth and, you know, the larger region needing to add, um, I want to say, 320-something thousand homes um, in the next few years. There's, um, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the solution to all mm-hmm. things affordability and, um, you know, housing supply. Um, but for a diverse, um, you know, economically viable place um, where people can actually, uh, you know, have a job here and actually afford the housing here, um, those things are out of sync right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you'll continue, if, if, if the status quo continues, you will see that um, in order to live here, people will demand higher salaries, things, things like that. There are larger, uh, you know, economic impacts for, for Arlington. Um, in this region. Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, for me, as uh, working for a higher educational institution, we're, we're always looking at the economic opportunity, economic mobility piece. Um, we live in a Northern Virginia. We we're fortunate to live in Northern Virginia. So in Northern Virginia, uh, there was a study that showed that if you were born in a low-income household, the bottom 20% of the income distribution your chances of, of when you become an adult, when you're in your early 30s, moving to the top 20% of households by income is almost one in five. The national average is 8%. Oh. So we are number one in the country for economic mobility. So place, place matters. Yeah. And within Northern Virginia, there's even a disparity between the jurisdictions. Mm. Arlington is, is a very high opportunity Uh, So if you're born in Arlington because of the community you've created here, the chances of you advancing through life and getting a a better um, family situation or the the American success story is very high, higher even than the one in five. So the question becomes, if, if place is a function of economic opportunity, who are the people that you want to live here? to take part of that economic opportunity that this community 
um, offers. Mm. So having all sorts of families here at all, in, all income levels, at all parts of their um, household formation, I think is very important because, because that, you know, they share in the opportunity that Arlington offers to better themselves and better the community. Yeah. Um, if you start, you know, congr you know I guess uh, ha having some of those people leave because of things like housing issues, I think would be a, a shame because, because Arlington is such a, a, an, op a, a, an opportunity rich area for personal economic mobility. That, that's that's how I look at it. This was supposed to be our dry dollars and cents economic session, but here you are having back your way into a question of our values as a community. Yeah. I think that's a really um, great point if we're going to be an engine for economic mobility, who, who gets access to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we are um, we're getting more questions. People are asking us to circle back to this question about spiking property values and displacement. I think this is a real worry, right? Who is Arlington for? I, you know, um, had received a comment just today. You know, maybe this is about letting the next generation buy in, but you're going to displace the older generation that's already here. So, is there any more that we can say either from? other jurisdictions or maybe a, a, a primer on, um, you know, how properties are valued now and how this um, hot market um, is, is already part of people's tax assessment or home values. You know, what, what can we give people, um, if any, to, to have some comfort that, you know, their, their uh, house that's assessed or home that's assessed at, you know, um, $900,000 today doesn't get assessed at, um, you know, uh, uh, a million five as soon as uh, any policy changes go into effect. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think as, as we've mentioned before, the, the pace of change is going to be slow. Um, the, the fact of the matter is most likely um, not too many of these uh, missing middle multi-unit properties are going to get built right away. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're going to re reflect the market value of the entire housing market of Arlington. As, as Cassie said, um, you know, the turnover rate is low to begin with, so the opportunities to build them, uh, like we mentioned, there, there are only 120 of them every year um, in, in, a, in a county that has uh, a population of 250,000, like 200, yeah, 240,000. Um, so roughly about you know uh, you know 100,000 over 100,000 households. Um, so so I th I don't think the the impact on the market values of the entire housing market will be affected by uh, what would start off as a handful of of transactions. Mm -hmm. I think the, the the forecast was 20 a year out of the 120 that you redevelop um, every year. So. Yeah. So I think the pace of property tax valuation growth um, won't be you know, largely, in the beginning, largely impacted by this, by, by this policy, because it's, it's just too small uh, a part of the housing market um, to have that, that outsized effect, I think. So um, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion of, I think, what will happen based on what we've seen in other communities across yeah. the country. I would agree with all of that. Um, I think, you know, if if every lot in some communities, you know, if every lot is that's currently zoned for single family, um, we're rezoned to allow for more development, more options. Um, you might see a increase in um, a change in the underlying land value. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You're going to see it if you don't change your zoning also, because it is going up every year, you're going to see, um, you're going to continue to feel that pressure. Um, I don't have a crystal ball about, you know, which direction would be worse, but the pressure, it's already there. It's mm -hmm. already happening. You cannot avoid it um, if you restrict your supply um, and, and are, you know, continue to regulate housing in this way. So um, it's... It's already there. It's I'm already there. Yes. Of agreement. It's no. baked in. It's we, had, we had talked about this earlier, um, that if you do nothing, uh, the our assessments are going to continue to go up. Yeah. Um, so if you were worried about displacing um, people doing nothing, it's going to keep the scarcity here, mm -hmm. which is going to make it more and more desirable every time we sell something, and then that's going to keep raising our property taxes. And the people you were worried about of us doing nothing, um, uh, if you're worried about them getting displaced, there's, there's 
that's going to still be an issue of just doing yeah. nothing. Yeah. You know, even at maybe a faster clip because the the housing is so scarce mm -hmm. that's here. I had seen a really interesting statistic by some economists analyzing the effects on property values um, uh, in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and they, generally speaking, it seemed like it varied citywide. <clears throat> but but in the places where there were the biggest jumps, it was sort of on the order of three to four percent. And I know that assessed property values went up six percent in Arlington last year. So I think that maybe uh, illustrates that point that the no change scenario, you know, could could threaten this too. Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity to note that we do have a real estate assessment relief program, real estate tax relief program yes. mm -hmm. um, for for people who are on fixed and moderate incomes who mm -hmm. maybe purchased their home yeah. many many years mm -hmm. ago when it was affordable to their mm -hmm. middle class income, um, and that income has shrunk or become fixed and and um, not available to them. So thanks for the chance to make that plug. I want to echo that, you know, displacement is a very real concern in Arlington. Mm -hmm. We're um, dealing with those effects all throughout the region. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a both and. Like, we, we have to increase supply and we have to be very attentive to affordability yeah. um, and displacement pressure. So not to write off displacement in any way, right. um, but it, it's happening already. And um, I think the data suggests that this is not an engine of displacement yeah. or of, you know, a huge spike in taxes mm -hmm. either. That's great to hear. And I, I'm, I'm really glad you made that point, Kelly, because this is, as I was mentioning at the top, one pillar in a large yeah. program about affordability in Arlington. And I think I know where my colleagues and I literally stay up at night thinking about displacement is really on the renter side, and yeah. especially those making 30% or less of very immediate mm -hmm. income. Um, you know, big investments and things like the Barcroft Apartments mm -hmm. recently to, to mm -hmm. try to prevent that displacement. So do you all see, this is an interesting sort of follow-up question on this point about the rate of turnover, which I thought was a really interesting insight. Um, does the pace of change in housing turnover take into account the age of single-family homeowners um, who might be more likely to sell? So is there a variety in communities if homeowners are on balance a little older, a little maybe have dogs that are ailing, you know, like a little, I, I know. Um, uh, but, but more seriously, right, do we, is there a way to acknowledge the, the variation that there may be in a community if your homeownership base is a little bit older? is that more likely to see faster turnover? I think all things being equal, um, yes. I mean, I think, I think some of the data from the missing middle studies show that your fastest growing households in Arlington are those over 65, mm -hmm. uh, those that live uh, in single person households. And the fastest household you're losing are millennials which are coming of age to build a family. Yeah. Uh, they're leaving. Right. Um, and I think that's, you know, those those households are definitely within that housing spectrum, looking for their next house. Mm -hmm. In terms of the in terms of the retiring people, it may go full circle back to um, a single family or a smaller footprint for them to to live in. Um, but at the same time, they may not want to live in a high rise or mid rise uh, uh, multi family situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the flexibility of of missing middle. Um, if that's the demand coming out of the community and, and there is those policies that provide developers the, um, you know, the, 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 the risk to take that risk to build for sale smaller units for um, senior households, mm -hmm. then, yeah, the market would respond to that if those policies were in place. Uh, there's, there's some interesting, in, some interesting uh, projects that are being tried in our area. You know, Falls Church had the Missing Middle Railroad mm -hmm. Cottages project, yeah. um, which was a pilot project. Uh, it's cottage style, missing middle, um, uh, zoned specifically for seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, two and a half, uh, two bedroom, you know, single level, level and a half uh, cottages, uh, you know, priced at about seven to eight hundred thousand mm. in a community that's one and a half million. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's a good example. Uh, I think Vienna has a couple of projects in the works, trying to to, to explore that as well. Um, so, yeah, th those are those are things that uh, potentially, you know, more housing choices yeah. can address. And so that's such an interesting example with those railroad cottages, particularly knowing the price points, and that required. Um, more density than one, like they, they couldn't build one cottage on one lot. No, so so that was a project that was zoned for four single family houses. Um, in, and they ended up building 10 um, 1,500 square foot cottages. 
So 10 households uh, in Leo 4, but the mass of the buildings was the same. Mm -hmm. If you add up the mass of four large houses, they more or less equal the mass of those cottages mm -hmm. that, were, that were built. Yeah. Um, some people said the price point was too high, but then again, it was the first. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no economies of scale. There's no, the, the, the developer had to go through, you know, two years of entitlement and, uh, and uh, you know, so, uh, so obviously the pricing reflects it being a pilot project. Mm -hmm. um, they had to create a new zoning um, uh, classification for mm -hmm. that, uh, I think, in, in the city. Uh, but that's an example of a, of a missing middle type that a developer wanted to try, and that's the price point he got without any scale or, or, or experience in building. Uh, he was, I think he was the first in Northern Virginia yeah. to build it. So um, with scale and less risk, you know, could the pricing go down? Possibly. But definitely they sold out quickly to senior, senior households. Yeah. Um, and... Um, you know that could be something that you know senior households in in Arlington could could also be looking for. We don't know. So one of the things that's really interesting is, and my understanding is that project was sort of a special exception yeah. process. You were talking about it two years. That's definitely something we've heard from folks, which is to say, you know, we're getting a few questions about you know stormwater impact, tree canopy impact. Why not say? We'd allow missing middle, but not by right. Missing middle, if we, you know, put put some community review around it, maybe some higher standards on stormwater. That's now um, uh, uh, higher standards on stormwater or tree canopy than what is required of single family homes. What happens if we do that? Hmm. Uh, I care deeply about tree canopy and and climate, and um, I think. Uh, restricting what you can do on on sites is is also not the answer to. Um, canopy or climate yeah. questions. Um, people driving, you know, and pay until you can afford to live here, as we said. Um, having more opportunities for people to live in the place, to age in place, right? To downsize from, um, from a house where you have your community and you've got your little theater and you've got all your, your things, your amenities. Um, that's, that's typically baked into all the methodologies of these studies that show, um, you know, that by and large, people, an owner who is an owner-occupied house, they're not going to necessarily just sell their house when zoning changes, yeah. um, that that is, that is not, that's not what happens. So um, that, that's my two cents there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you know, there, there's been some articles written about why, say, Minneapolis has, has generated so little uh, missing middle types after they went through their um, rezoning. I think one, one of the reasons was, as mentioned before, um, they didn't have the developer base that was comfortable building uh, missing middle type. So that's one thing that over time can change. The other one is the devil is in the details with various rezonings. So the more, I guess, rules that developers have to comply with um, add up to the cost of, of uh, developing these types of properties and the risk. Mm. Um, so while a lot of the you know, people, what people are asking about are definitely well-intentioned, and government definitely has a role to play in addressing them. Um, I think the flip side is when you're looking at a housing scarcity issue, um, the more the more regulations or things you try to do with housing adds to the cost of housing. That's just the reality. Yeah. Um, and and to and to put that into the price of housing, there's a trade-off. Uh, you do address some of these things that people care deeply about, but you end up with more, a house that's more expensive than it would have been. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's really a trade-off that governments and communities have to go through. And I think a large part of Minneapolis's experience is that. And that's why I said it's an iterative process. Mm -hmm. uh, then you come back and say, okay, this is not working as we should. You know, what should we tweak? What other new incentives or what new regulations or less regulations? And then trying to get that formula right to trigger more de more housing production yeah. is is ultimately the goal, but you know definitely the all, all these concerns um, uh, are valid, but there's a trade off with the, the price of housing. I think that's really well put. Absolutely, and I think to some extent that's the conversation our community is engaged in now. Um, okay, Miranda, we have a question for you. From a realtor perspective, who is likely to buy missing middle types versus single family housing? We've talked about that a little bit, but we also talked about the seniors, right? That's a population we haven't talked about as much. Um, 
if, if these types of housing were, were legal and a few of them were built in neighborhoods, what, what could people expect out of their new neighbors? What do you think the demographics might look like? Okay, so based upon this study, the price points of your income, and I, and I double-checked last night with a lender just to see on these proposed um, uh, purchase prices, Very what helpful. would the actual, um, what kind of money? Would these people have yeah. to make um, to live here? And starting, and I went on the the cheapest end of um, five hundred and twenty, if that was what it was. You know, he said they're going to make a hundred thousand to live there. So a hundred thousand, um, can imagine. You know, with our um, with our median income here is a hundred and something, the low one hundreds. Um, it's going to be the same type of person that you've seen. Of, ha. <laughs> College educated person, you know, that is in some um, professional uh, uh, job here. Um, and then up to the higher end of the side by side duplexes, so they'd have to make on the low end of the 1.1 million at least 210,000. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, to think of what this person um, would be doing, what their educational background and everything else to have these incomes. Mm -hmm. um, without me breaking it all down into what you could expect, um, I think it'll be more of what we already have here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this is a very educated um, county, um, um, full of, um, you know, me with just my bachelor's degree, I'm like one of the least educated people <laughs> <laughs> here in, in the county. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, we're looking at incomes around a 100 to 210. Yeah, and um, right now there. those households or form, you know, households in formation are competing with people making 250, 300, exactly. 350 uh, for the same point. house. They can't compete. They cannot. They cannot compete. No. Um, so this is that foothold for for a, a specific band. It's not a panacea for no. all things, okay. um, but for people who otherwise are out in the market competing for the same house that you know that two million dollar house. I think that's such a good point because we all read these stories, you know, nationally, right, about these heartbreaks of, of you know, that the nice young couple putting a bid in, you know, mm. a million different houses and not being able to find one. And so your point, you know, it's it's um, not this is not our, our, our policy for our low income neighbors. But when you have, you know, people who are making close to area median income, mm -hmm. maybe even a little more mm -hmm. competing with people who are making three to four times exactly. area median income. So I'm sure you're seeing some of that heartbreak mm -hmm. with your buyers, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, like I said, you know, but Kelly's right. They can't, they can't compete. I mean, these are like the low end numbers, and right. their competition is not going to be, <laughs> especially with rising interest mm -hmm. rates and yes. what mm -hmm. might have been exactly. in their range a few months ago no longer is because mm -hmm. that yeah. long term um, cost of interest. So absolutely, yeah. One of the other things, and I, I am keeping an eye out that we might have to wrap up soon, but, but one thing that we hear a lot about speaking about things in the national headlines, um, this is a little bit of a curveball, we didn't prepare you all for this question, <laughs> okay. but um, the idea of institutional investors buying up single family homes. We know this is happening in communities across the country. It seems mm -hmm. to be targeting communities of color, right? historically black and brown communities. Um, there is definitely a worry that this, could, this phenomenon could come to Arlington. Um, now, right, in, in our single family market. And I've definitely heard the concern that um, allowing missing middle forms would hasten that kind of presence. You'd, you'd, you'd see a lot more institutional investors. Do you all have any um, uh, professional expertise on that or, or thoughts about, you know, I think generally we've not seen that here yet. No. Why not? Is it coming? And what would zoning reform do? Um, I think by far the reason why we haven't seen um, single family rentals here or build to rent communities mm -hmm. is because our housing prices are just too high mm -hmm. for them to meet their um, their their financial requirements. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why most of, most of these communities um, are in the Sun Belt mm -hmm. and Texas areas where the housing prices are much lower uh, lo relative to rents. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So they they can get they can get a higher return. Um, by renting um, more moderately um, priced priced houses, mm. um, and that's the reason why you don't hear of these um, companies being active, not just in Arlington but in the entire DMV area, mm. because our house prices are just too high. And you don't hear, and we're not the only one. They, like in the Northeast, 
California, mm -hmm. by and large, these, these, these companies don't have portfolios mm -hmm. in those high-priced markets. The, mm -hmm. the, the ratio of household rent, of, of single-family rent, to the price they would have to buy the houses for uh -huh. is, is, is too low. Um, so they, they're more concentrated on the more affordable houses, uh, more affordable housing markets. Um, uh, I think I know of just one community in Prince George's that's being built for rent, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even then, the, the difference between the difference between the rent they would they would have to charge, mm -hmm. and what somebody would pay for a mortgage to own rather than rent one of the units is not very large. Uh -huh. So that so the argument is why would somebody rent if they're if, pretty close to if being they're able pretty to buy. close to, right. to being able to buy. Yeah, because the rents the rents here are just too high mm -hmm. for, for 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 that to, to make sense, and that's the reason why we haven't seen a lot of it in, yeah. in this market. But, but, yeah. And similarly, why would a developer who's looking at um, you know redeveloping a site, why would they rent it or build apartments and rent it if the m more economically feasible um, option is ownership? And mm -hmm. with the pent up demand we have here, it's a pretty clear case for the ownership lane um, in, in your single family um, areas. So yeah, totally, totally agree with all that. It's not that compatible with the business model of mm -hmm. institutional investors. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that they aren't everywhere and you know, having huge impacts on cities and cities are trying to figure out how to regulate those types of investments and right. um, keep good actors in and maybe restrict bad actors um, mm -hmm. because it's not a monolith. The you know the single family rental investors are not a monolith, but mm -hmm. um, definitely hear the concern. It's um, it's not on my top list for Arlington just because of um, your the, all the things that we just said around values. How high yeah, home prices are. Mm -hmm. And so, is there any reason to think um, that that ratio? Basically, you're talking about a theme about the arbitrage opportunity, <laughs> right? It gets gets different if you're allowed to build an eightplex or buy up an eightplex and rent it out versus buy up a single family house and rent it out. Um, I, I don't think the the ratios are are going to be that that different. Uh, they may be they may be better, but they don't. They don't compare to the opportunities that these companies have in places uh, along the Sun Belt and Texas, which have much lower land values, much easier zoning requirements, uh, lower lower uh, building costs in general, and uh, a large renter pool mm -hmm. uh, that would like to live in a single family house. Uh, mm. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't foresee that being a large factor yeah. in, in in our metro area, um, and um, you know, so that's that's why I see in the short term. I don't think yeah. it's a, a big factor. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up, let me pivot off that and say, you know, what what should we be worried about? So I'm going to ask not to end on a negative note, but just in closing, can you give us one consideration that you think is most important for my colleagues and me for our entire community as we're considering potential zoning reforms, um, what is one piece of advice you'd offer us or one consideration you'd raise? I can start. Um, looking back at what Arlington has done on the metro corridors, um, you know, today we have, I believe, 48 percent of the assessed property values are in areas that um, allowed for more density. And that's a different kind of density than we're talking about mm -hmm. here. We're talking about soft density or gentle density, um, you know, the kind that is compatible with the neighborhoods that we're talking about. Um, but just think of that potential um, because that is, you know, kind of a critical tax base and it also distributes the burden of taxes across more um, owners. And we know that they're out there. Mm -hmm. We know those, you know, want to be um, first time homeowners are out there um, and there's not really a place for them to get in. Yeah. And Callie, it's, I'm, I just said we were going to wrap up, but I'm getting multiple questions. And I think this is because we are counter-programmed tonight with the Plan Langston Boulevard community meeting. Oh. And so I think this is coming in a lot. We're getting questions about, well, why not just limit the missing middle to those the very planning corridors you were talking about, to uh, the RB corridor or mm. Langston Boulevard or Columbia Pike, you know, maybe go one neighborhood deep and allow these types of things. Why, why think countywide? So, you know, knowing that you were just giving us that advice, um, sure. is there anything else you'd add on that point? Well, your housing problem is not limited to certain corridors. I do leave it to the planners to, um, you know, figure out how this makes its way into policy in place. Um, but you are, um, there's not enough developable land in those places to even 
inch mm -hmm. at um, the need. Yeah. So I think you have to look countywide. It's really a regional problem, a mm -hmm. regional growth problem. You can't solve it all. Um, but in order to solve Arlington's piece of it, I think um, you have to you have to at least look countywide. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So back to advice, cautions, things we should think about as a community as we move forward. Well, okay, I can tell you what I worry about just looking at this, um, the missing middle, um, all the work that's been done. I look and I wonder what's to stop um, developers from only building the duplexes and the mm. townhomes, um, which are, you know, according to this price point, uh, the really, really high end um, of the missing middle type instead of what I think we're trying to achieve is a more... Um, diverse that people can actually still live and work in Arlington um, and I don't know how you I don't even know if there's any way to possibly um, uh, do something um, regulatory that can predict a certain outcome but that's one of my worries just here yeah. as a resident we're just going to continue to build um, the townhouses and then the these relatively large um, duplexes that are yeah. proposed here in this missing middle survey. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great point. I think a really fair concern. Eric, what do you think? Um, <laughs> I, I think two points for me. One is, um, you know, it, it, it is good that this is an exercise in planning for growth. Yeah. Um, I think Arlington is going to continue to grow. Uh, it's, too, it's too dynamic of a community not to grow. Um, but I think if you don't plan for growth, growth will do the planning for you. Mm. Uh. Um, the people are coming, the new people are coming, the, the additional people are coming, whether we plan for them or not. So uh, that's going to impact the community. We're talking about another you know, 50,000 people on top of 250,000 so that, that over the next 20 or so years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to your point, I think you mentioned it earlier, um, Missing Middle is one tool in an entire tool chest mm -hmm. of trying to produce more housing um, and I applaud Arlington in other uh, ways of doing it. Your, your community affordable program is definitely very dynamic. Uh, you're producing a lot of uh, high density affordable um, you know, uh, projects that are uh, case studies for other jurisdictions mm -hmm. to, to, to look at. Um, so I think that's another tool. Um, so I think, I think people shouldn't be too overly worried that all the burden of new housing production will fall on missing middle. I think I think it's a it's one tool with many tools that that you your commu the community is is talking about, and so I think the the impact will be distributed mm -hmm. among all these other tools that I think you're 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 looking at. Uh, missing middle is is just one of them. Um, like uh, I think we've heard tonight, uh, it, it may be a slow process or even um, a, a modest impact in the beginning. So I think having multiple discussions of other tools, I think, is, is great. Yeah. yeah, that's a fantastic point to wrap up on. And um, this is one tool of many. This conversation has been one facet of many when it comes to the missing middle um, and zoning reform. I'm incredibly grateful to the three of you. I really appreciate the perspectives. Again, we don't have a crystal ball, but we can learn from other communities, from data, from where we've been, um, and from real people's experiences. So um, whether they be uh, home buyers or otherwise. So I'm so glad to have had those insights from you all. Um, but of course, as I said, um, the economics of housing and housing development is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, so we have two more of these sessions. Um, they are part of a series. This is part of a series. So on September 28th, there'll be a program on the history and future of zoning and housing policy. So a chance to really take that deep dive into what zoning policy is, how it's evolved in Arlington, what it's looked like throughout the country. October 12th, there's going to be a conversation about planning for growth. I love that. If you don't plan for growth, growth will do the planning for you. And so we've gotten a lot of great questions tonight about things like, how does Arlington plan for the impact of more residents um, uh, and that impact on our stormwater or utility systems, um, our impact in the public schools? Uh, how do we plan for a robust tree canopy? Um, so that is a great topic of conversation for October 12th. We'll have some experts in that kind of comprehensive planning piece of the puzzle. Um, for anybody who was not able to attend, um, if you'd like to, to, to share, of course, if you know neighbors who'd like to see this who, who weren't able to join us live, we, this recording is going to be available on our website. 
Um, and as I noted at the top, this is just one of many ways to engage. We know some people have questions and want to learn. And for them, these series or information on the site can be helpful. We also have some folks who want to share opinions. And we really welcome that, too. And so my colleagues and I are hosting a series of now 20 community conversations. We've added more to be able to take everybody off the wait list. They are going to be ongoing through October. Um, and as always, to learn more, you can visit our website um, at arlingtonva.us and just search Missing Middle in the toolbar. It'll take you to a lot of materials. Um, as we close out, you'll see some more information session uh, up on the screen about uh, those, those further opportunities for engagement. Thank you all so much. Thank you again to our panelists. And good night. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.